Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Wu. I am the director for the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first of our Critical Issues Confronting China series. Um, I'm delighted, uh, first of all, to uh, see uh, so many eminent uh, scholars here in this field. Uh, for those of you who are students, I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, for those of you who are students, uh, first of all, we do have a uh, Fairbanks Center student network, uh, which is uh, newly set up. Uh, if any of you are students who have not signed up for that network, uh, please feel free to come down and grab a flyer or to scan the QR code that will be right next to me. Um, the student network will uh, provide you with opportunities to connect with uh, some of the uh, special opportunities uh, here to meet others who are interested in these topics. And so I'm going to connect these two threads here, um, including one of those possibilities would be to connect with some of the scholars in the audience here, uh, both from China and from Europe, who I think would have quite a lot to say about this critical issue that is confronting China over a possible Taiwan Straits crisis and the U.S. response to it. So I just want to urge uh, students who have not signed up for the network, please do so. For those of you who have not completed your registration, uh, please send in your bio to do so as well. Um, for the rest of you, I just want to welcome you uh, to our flagship series. Uh, this will continue through November. Um, for those of you who have not signed up for our events newsletter, um, there's also a QR code that will be next to me. So please come over and scan the QR code and add yourselves to our events newsletter. We have over 100 events throughout the year, and uh, that will be your best way to stay informed about it. Um, the last uh, announcement that I'll make is uh, next week, uh, this uh, series will continue uh, with a lecture on the future of great power competition featuring uh, Oriana Schuyler Mastro from Stanford University. Yes, we do have two Stanford uh, guests here in a row, but I promise you not everyone in this series will be from Stanford. And so uh, with this, let me turn it over to introducing our guests today. Uh, as I mentioned, um, one of our uh, illustrious guests today is from Stanford, uh, but we're very proud to continue to claim him as one of our own. Uh, Ike Freeman uh, currently is a Hoover Fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution, where he has, uh, I think for those of you who are graduate students, uh, he has one of those uh, really desired jobs after a postdoc, where he has a tenure track position but does not have teaching obligations, um, but purely a research obligation. So in terms of right graduate uh, Concern. This is almost winning the lottery uh, at uh, one of the, our uh, most prestigious uh, research institutions. Um, he's also a non-resident research fellow at the China Maritime Studies Institute uh, at the U.S. Naval War College uh, just south of here at Newport. Uh, but the reason I say that we are very proud to claim him as one of our own is because uh, he did all of his training, or most of his training, uh, here at Harvard. Uh, he was an uh, East Asian Studies and History concentrator at Harvard. College. Uh, he also then earned his master's degree at the Regional Studies East Asia program here at Harvard uh, in our GSAS department. Um, and then he went on to uh, Balliol College at Oxford, where he earned a DPhil in China Studies uh, before returning here again to Harvard, uh, where he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, most recently at the Balfour Center um, at the Kennedy School. And he was also an uh, alumni of the uh, Columbia, Harvard, China, and the World Program. So you'll notice even though he's Stanford today, uh, you see, saw many mentions of Harvard there, and we're always happy to welcome one of our own back. Um, he's here with his co-author, uh, Hugo Bromley. Uh, the, in case any of you have missed it, um, they put out a uh, much talked about uh, report uh, on day one, which came out from uh, the Hoover Institution. You can find it on the Hoover Institution's website. Uh, if any of you can't find it, you're welcome to email me and I can send you that link. Um, and so uh, Hugo uh, is uh, a historian uh, of geopolitics and British political economy. Um, he is currently a postdoc research associate at the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge University, where he's affiliated with Robinson College. Um, he also earned his MPhil in history at Cambridge and will soon be uh, receiving his DPhil in history as well. Just received it, so we're all oh, good. Oh, just received it. So, latest breaking news. Yes. So, uh, so uh, he uh, and uh, 
has also been his DPhil in history uh, from Cambridge, um, and he has a background, uh, uh, an undergraduate degree in history as well from the London School of Economics. So uh, please join me in welcoming Ike and Hugo uh, for uh, the uh, talk today on avalanche decoupling. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. I should say, in those biographies, in their thoroughness, one point was missed off, which was Ike's time at Cambridge, very briefly, as an MPhil student when we met all those years ago. And we've kept talking ever since. And this is, this is the result. Um, as I say, it's a great privilege to be here today. I want to start things with this quote, which emerged from the House Committee on the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party in December. The United States lacks a contingency plan for the economic and financial impacts of conflict with the PRC. And as tensions rise in the Taiwan Strait, as more and more people focus on this issue, this is a particular concern because it is not just that there is an absence of a coherent contingency plan, it's that we're caught in a binary. A binary between some who would rather not think about this issue or this suite of issues and are not focusing on the economic side of this really scary geopolitical situation. And on the other side, those who are still thinking in terms of what one might call Russia plus. The suite of financial tools developed over the last 30 years um, focused on financial sanctions that we have used time and time again. What Ike and I are trying to do with all of our work, and this report in particular, is break us out of that binary and try and think of new ways of economic statecraft that can not only have a deterrent effect, but also reassure allies and partners and protect the broad suite of US interests. So we're going to do this in sort of three parts. I'm going to start things off on thinking about economic coercion. This builds on the report as well as an article forthcoming in international security. Ike's then going to talk about where we are. And then finally, in the last few minutes, we'll talk you through the day one plan. So understanding economic coercion, um, as was mentioned, I'm a historian of British manufacturing and trade. I did my DPhil on the early modern period. Um, so you're going to see some 18th century English history creeping in as we go through this. Um, that, that's the Port of London. When we're thinking about economic coercion, or, and we're thinking about trying to influence an ally's behavior, there's two things you can weaponize. And it's important to make a distinction between the two. The first thing you can do is you can make regulations, laws, taxes, whatever you like, affecting your own market. In other words, the national control of yourself and your allies. That market could be national, it could be imperial. I'm going to dwell on the imperial point a bit in a sec. But secondly, you can seek to reach beyond your own national market to interdict global trade flows and the trade of third countries. There's two basic ways to do this. Um, one way is to use military force and just physically stop ships or trade flowing through a choke point. Or you can access central nodes. This is the um, recent idea of weaponizing independence through central nodes that's being talked about a lot, i.e. things within your national market, in theory or in practice, but that have global implications and global significance for trade. The image up there is of the Straits of Malacca, and one of the things that gets talked about a lot in the IR literature is the concept of a Malacca blockade. I'm going to come back to that. But when we're thinking about economic coercion, there's two principles that we would really highlight. The first is a very old principle. It dates back to Manker Olson and others, which is that countries under sanction or blockade adapt dynamically. They find ways around. They invent new processes, invent new systems, and the state can act too by rationing, by spurring innovation. That's all well known. What we'd really like to emphasize in our work is that neutral countries also adapt dynamically. And the reason for this is very straightforward. When you seek to draw lines in the global economy to restrict supply and change the market forces, prices of things go up and or down if you're restricting, if you're restricting demand in the, in the target country and they get out of line with the rest of the global economy. That creates an arbitrage opportunity, right? To trade past economic coercion and to profit from those distorted prices. In that moment, every neutral state in the world has, has an incentive to undermine your economic coercion, particularly if you're reaching beyond your own market, especially if you're reaching beyond your own market, and that presents the coercing power with a choice. 
escalate in the use of either other forms of economic coercion or military force against that neutral, or conciliate and try and find a way to accommodate their own economic incentives. And that binary is something that repeats throughout history and takes us to a, a, a pretty fundamental contention, which is that if your strategy involves interdicting global trade, the larger the potential neutral community, the harder economic coercion becomes. In other words, because we have to enforce compliance on third states with, our, with huge incentives to break or trade past your economic coercion, if it is a large neutral community, that task of coercion becomes incredibly difficult. Here's a picture of Catherine the Great, and this is where the 18th century history comes in. Because when we think about this, we think back to the long history of economic coercion through blockade, which is also the history of the concept of neutrality in international relations. Um, I'm standing in America, so let's go back to a war that um, this country and mine had something to do with in the American Revolutionary War. After the entry of France into that conflict, Britain chooses to put France under blockade, under a distant blockade, and sees all naval stores supplies going into France. The dominant producer of naval stores is Russia. And Catherine the Great founds a league of armed neutrality to insist on the rights of third countries to trade with both powers through international shipping lanes. She's not doing this out of hatred for Britain or malign influence, but rather because she wants to continue to take advantage of the huge opportunities that come from selling that product through. Britain actually reaches an accommodation and concedes that neutral trade can come through. This world of escalation and conciliation and crisis through economic coercion reaches a, reaches a kind of height with the Napoleonic Wars. There's a second armed neutrality. Again, it's Russia, this time joined by many more neutral Scandinavian nations. Again, it's about naval stores trading with France and Britain's desire to avoid that. This time it escalates to open conflict. There's the first battle of Copenhagen. Though that battle is victorious for the British, eventually a, a concession is made once again to Russia that naval stores can pass through the blockade. The blockade is weakened. Economic coercion is weakened. Interestingly, of course, in the course of that escalation with neutrals, you get competitive embargoes between Britain and the League of Armed Neutrality. That has a significant um, influence on Britain deciding to seek peace in 19, in 17, um, it's 1801, forgive me. Of course, no country in history has benefited more from its neutral status than the United States. Um, this is a fun little graph. It's of the US Merchant Marine. And the US Merchant Marine is really forged through the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars out of the opportunities that come from trading through blockades and trading with both sides of a conflict at a time when prices are distorted by economic coercion. Um, you can see the huge jump there. And this is not original, you know, this is, this is something that's widely known across the literature. Of course, Britain won't stand that. There's increasing attempts to enforce the blockade. Um, blockade running is a key causes belli of the War of 1812. When we think about economic coercion of great powers, so often we think about the two world wars. In these two conflicts, Britain imposes a distant blockade, tries to restrict the flow of trade into and out of Germany through the Atlantic. You can see, broadly speaking, the, the zones of, of far blockade on that map. Initially, these efforts fail. And they fail because of the role of neutral countries in transshipping products, importing products, and then shipping them on to Germany. The most famous one is Holland, which is deliberately left out of the Schieffen Plan to function in this role. But there are many others. Britain tries to restrict the trade of neutrals fails to do so. Once America enters the conflict in 1917, economic coercion becomes much more effective. But it's really important to emphasize that when we think about the world wars, we are thinking about an economic system in which the number of relevant neutral states is unbelievably small because we are thinking about an imperial economy, right? A very small number of countries control the overwhelming share, an overwhelming share of global resources. Something similar can be said about World War II. And it's worth noting that it's in the interwar period, through the League of Nations, through, through discussions of global systems of governance, that sanctions become an idea, and Nicholas Mulder has done so much of the great work on this, that, we th that people can think about a combination of multilateral coordination and imperial systems, allowing you to weaponize, not critical nodes, but production, to coerce states to comply with international uh, norms. 
this fails. In fact, many could, would argue those embargoes drive states towards autarky and expansion. But it's really striking that when war does break out with a neutral United States and a neutral USSR, British economic coercion fails completely. This is one of my favorite little stories. This is the Trans-Siberian Railway, um, which before Operation Barbarossa regularly shipped American raw materials across the entirety of the, of the Russian state, either to Germany or in order to backfill supplies that were then shipped from Russia to Germany, Germany in this period, from the USSR. So it's in that context, and it's with that sense of the role of neutral states that we confront where we are today. And I'll make one final point before I hand over to Ike, which is that the rise in the, in the international relations literature of economic coercion of sanctions in the 1990s comes once again at a moment when we're thinking about multilateral coordination. People like Kim Elliott, advocates of sanctions of that period, are imagining sanctions passed through the UNSC, right? They're talking about multilateral coordination to compel smaller states. That world is blown up by Crimea at which point we start talking about economic sanctions of one great power on another. And that takes us to the world we're in today. Thank you, Hugo. And thank you, by the way, to Mark for hosting us and for that uh, unnecessarily generous introduction. It's, it's great to be back. So perhaps we should have known better. But in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the United States government, at least, did not absorb this historical lesson. In fact, neither did Wall Street and pretty much anyone who does sanctions for a living. We, would to we were told that the sanctions imposed on Russia were something altogether different from what we had seen before. Someone called it a financial nuclear bomb. Uh, you had predictions, serious people based on serious modeling, uh, suggesting that the Russian economy would head towards collapse within weeks to months. Well, how is that going for us? I find this chart completely fascinating. So what you can see here is Russia's inflation rate, the exchange rate, which is the relationship of how many rubles you can buy for a dollar, and the interest rate. Um, but the key point is to see February 2022 comes, the sanctions are imposed, Immediately, the ruble loses half of its value as everyone and their mother tries to get their capital out of Russia and put it safely someplace else. This poses a systemic threat to Russia's financial system. Normally, if everyone shows up at the bank, tries to get their money back, it's a wonderful life and the system collapses. But what Russia's central bank did was they took a set of decisive actions which stabilized the situation within a matter of weeks. They raised deposit rates to 20%. They put restrictions on your ability to take money out of the bank and then to take it out of the country. They did a number of other uh, technical measures relating to uh, exporters. And oil prices went up, which, means, which meant that Russia was taking in more oil revenue. And because the United States and the, its fellow G7 countries didn't have anything left in their sanctions toolkit that they were willing to use, they chose to let Russia's oil and gas keep flowing, at least in the short term. This allowed Russia to stabilize its financial system and put itself on a pathway towards a long-term stable war footing. I'm just going to show you a couple of other graphs to illustrate this point because it's so important for understanding why many looking at the Russia sanctions playbook are acknowledging that it's a failure. This is Russia's uh, monthly incomes, the monthly state revenues from oil and gas sales. Uh, this is sort of stabilized because the, the line is a bit uh, uh, jaggedy. But as you can see, uh, Russia is taking in about as much money as it was before the invasion and arguably even more. And then this is a chart of real incomes, uh, inflation adjusted wages for Russian households. And as you can see, the ordinary Russian is doing rather well. So in this context, we want to turn to imagining what a day one crisis over Taiwan would be like. Now, there are many scenarios that we can imagine that would cause a US-China rupture. We can imagine uh, an invasion from across the strait. We can imagine a quarantine or blockade scenario. We can imagine a crisis in the South China Sea that escalates. Many scenarios can be imagined. There is no good historical analogy 
given the threat that this would pose to global financial stability, perhaps the only good one is the outbreak of World War I, when financial markets were thrown into a condition of paralysis, stock markets were closed for the better part of a year, uh, and the globalized trading system as we had known it prior to 1914 never recovered. Because it's so hard to imagine a scenario like this, and because so many scenarios are plausible, it can be hard to visualize it, and in particular to get on the same page when talking with others about what that scenario looks like. The approach we take in this report is not to take a position on how or when China might choose to move against Taiwan, what the cause of this rupture may be. We just imagine a break glass political scenario. We imagine a world in which China takes an action such that there is a bipartisan consensus in the United States that something fundamental has changed and the economic relationship cannot continue as it once was. We can all exercise our imaginations about what that might be. But we would suggest that regardless of whether it's an invasion scenario or a blockade or something else, a few things are likely. Uh, one is that there would be a global financial market shock, not only because trade flows in and out of China or in and out of Taiwan might be disrupted for as long as fighting would last, but also because there would be substantial uncertainty about how a conflict might escalate and what the United States might do in the way of sanctions or embargoes or something else that might aggravate the economic shock. So a lot of uncertainty about the future of the global economy, both in the short and the long term. Finally, we're talking about significant follow-on implications from the disruptions to supply chains. We can all remember the COVID experience where shortages of a few chips or intermediate components shut down production for entire auto supply lines. We're talking about this, but at a vastly larger scale with implications for employment, for prices, uh, a combination of factors that put central banks, by the way, in a very difficult position. We're talking about a situation where the United States and its allies and partners would probably say, oops, there's some critical production where we depend on China still, and we need to take that production back as soon as possible, whether because China has shut off uh, exports of this good or that good, or because we believe we can no longer be dependent on a country where we are, that is now our adversary to produce something upon which we rely. So, in the crisis, there are many ways you can imagine it going, and it's very hard to put numbers on what the situation would be. But I think we can say with some confidence that the US government and its allies would face two interrelated challenges. First, they would have a number of priorities related to the immediate crisis. Second, they would have to imagine a longer term question of how they would reimagine the global economic order. Because if China did choose to cross US red lines in this way, it would not just be a story about Taiwan. It would be a story about China moving against a global order, including a rules-based trading system. And if a conflict resulted in the destruction of that system, it might prove very, very challenging to rebuild. So in this context, we think we can say with some confidence that the US would have at least five relevant economic interests. The first, as I've already mentioned, is preventing the meltdown of the US economy and financial system, and moreover, preventing global financial meltdown because the United States would not be insulated from that. Second would be the goal of breaking US dependence on PRC production. And also, and this is a harder, but, a harder question, but equally important, helping US allies and, port and partners like the UK, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and others to break their own dependence on China so that they wouldn't be vulnerable to uh, coercion. Third, the United States would have this interest in maintaining a functional rules-based trading system. And this isn't just highfalutin language about the liberal international order. It is very practically about how the United States, after a Taiwan crisis was resolved, would be able to continue to trade with its friends and partners. Fourth, the US would have an interest in maintaining the role of its currency, which is so central to the global financial system and to global trade. Again, this isn't just about the principle of the matter. It's also because 
dollar hegemony is, at the end of the day, what enables the U.S. government to enforce sanctions, export controls, and so forth. Things that prevent dangerous dual-use components from falling into the hands of countries like Russia, North Korea, and possibly China as well. Finally, we might have an interest in punishing China, not just out of a sense of vengeance, but out of a uh, clear-eyed political calculus of pushing China to the negotiating table so we could resolve whatever crisis we faced. And that would be a legitimate interest in the scenario that we're talking about. The point that Hugo and I are making is it would not be the only relevant US interest. It would have to be balanced against the rest. And moreover, most of the world might not agree with, but would at least recognize that the first four interests were legitimate. It would be much harder to get the rest of the world on the same page with the idea that punishing China was such a high priority that their own economic interests should be subordinated to it. And this is the problem with the discussion about contingency planning today. Because too often, as Hugo said, the discussion proceeds from the assumption that if China moved against Taiwan, Taiwan's so important that we would do a Russia plus style thing, that we would throw the book at China and do everything we could to restrict their ability to trade with the world. But not only can China learn from Russia's experience, China has vastly more resources and has done a much longer term and more careful job preparing for such a shock. China has the world's largest oil reserves, almost a billion barrels in their strategic petroleum reserves. And they have stockpiles of food and pretty much any other commodity you can think of. China imports a lot, including food. But that dependence on imports is illusory. China used to be self-sufficient in food. China started importing stuff like meat because the population got rich enough to start buying nice steaks from Australia and New Zealand. They could go back to being self-sufficient if they wanted to. Uh, they supported a population of over a billion people without any meat imports uh, for hundreds of years, or at least for decades. Um, finally, or penultimately, US allies would be very hard hit. Now, it's very hard, as I said, to model the precise effects of the crisis because there's so many permutations of the scenario. But crudely, uh, when this has been modeled, uh, the point of this chart is that a country like South Korea or Japan, and indeed all of the ASEAN economies, would be devastated if trade were shut down. These countries rely on trade into China, trade out of China. They're part of supply chains in which China produces components that can't be easily substituted. And so if the US policy were to try to shut down trade in and out of China, it would be staking out a position that was not in the interests of its allies and partners. China needs the global market, but the global market also needs China's products. China represents like a th almost a third of global manufacturing value added, and half of that is exported. This is an industrial base of an unprecedented size and scale. It cannot be rebuilt outside China within six months or a year or two years. This is a serious long-term dependence, and it requires a long-term vision to unwind. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, there is the theoretical point that Hugo made, which is about the size of the neutral community. Over 120 countries count China as their largest trading partner. A good number of them have land borders with China. These countries would have an interest in continuing to buy and sell with China whatever the United States did. Is it really realistic if we were not able to topple Russia with sanctions at the outset of the crisis that we could do the same to China? We don't believe so. And that's why we believe the United States needs to come up with an approach to economic coercion which doesn't involve sanctions. And I'm gonna hand it back to Hugo right now to sketch out what that plan would be. Okay, I'm gonna stay seated for this bit and we're gonna hop backwards and forwards. Let's see if this works. So we find it helpful. I mean, many, many people when they're thinking about these questions go to modeling and to try and guessing the economic impact. Um, we go to a boat somewhere in off the Canadian coastline. And the reason we start here is because before we can start to develop detailed contingency planning, it is vital to see alignment on the fundamental principles that would be behind any one approach. And it is those principles that are so essential for coalition building among allies, hence the Atlantic Charter. We highlight four. 
that are at the should be con and continue to be at the heart of U.S. contingency planning. The first builds on many of the things Ike said. Do not break supply chains on day one. And, even, and outside of a very narrow suite of critical technologies, firms would need to be given adequate time to reshore. The second is the overwhelming importance of the dollar. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. We can get into some techniques to, to do so in questions. The third, and this goes back to the point about the neutral community, is that it is not viable to ask third countries to decouple from China as part of an economic deterrent or as part of an economic contingency plan. Instead, the US should conceive of what it, it would do in any Taiwan crisis as global economic recovery and leadership containing the US respecting its own national interests, not pure punishment. The final principle is that any attempt to move away from sanctions and towards the use of the national market gives you a fundamental problem with transshipment. And we've seen this a bit in the Russia case. In other words, everyone has an incentive, if you are doing discriminatory trade policy against one country, to buy a Chinese washing machine, cross out the made in China sign, write where in, made in wherever in crayon, and ship it on into the US market. To tackle that problem, and to reassure third countries of the need to, that the US is committed to maintaining and continuing a rules-based trading system, <coughs> requires an incentive structure for countries to hit the minimum bar of honesty of trade reporting. So those are the four principles, and then from there, we, sit, we start to think about developing policy pathways that might implement them. So how would you actually do this? What we are positing, and we've put a provocative image of an avalanche on the front of our report, is that Set the critical stuff aside for the uncritical stuff, for the mugs, for the microphones, for the jigsaw puzzles. If you want to take this back from China, you have to take it back slowly and over time in such a way that firms and capital markets <clears throat> will be able to find the most efficient, cost-effective way of producing out of China and rebuild an industrial base that in many cases does not exist. You also want to do that in a way that doesn't create massive inefficiencies by trying to do command and control for complex supply chains that are ultimately not that critical. And you want to send a signal of reassurance that you're abiding by at least the spirit of international trade law. So here's how we suggest doing it. You label China a systemic national security threat. You do it in Section 232 of the Trade Act of 1962. So that is the, 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 the legal justification upon which the Trump administration did its national security uh, tariffs on uh, steel and aluminum. And the reason for doing this is that you want to signal to the world, China poses a systemic national security threat. We're going to reduce our dependence on this market to zero over time. But we're going to do it in a ratcheting way that Congress is going to control. So it's not going to be moving in an ad hoc way with the president deciding day by day what the tariff should be. It's going to move in a slow and controlled way, but it's going to, once the ratchet mechanism has begun, it's going to be difficult to stop. The idea is that this will give firms and capital markets a confidence that over a period of time, at the end of the window, manufacturing in China will not be possible but that everyone will have to find their own way of producing outside China, and the investment will come first, and then the jobs will follow. We think that that approach could be coordinated with core US allies, particularly Japan, Canada, the UK, and Australia. Uh, as these countries did it, dealing with the transshipment issue would require third countries, the Brazils of the world, the Mexicos, the Vietnams, to accurately report what products they were buying from China and re-exporting, including what components they were buying from China, processing and re-exporting. Uh, and it would be essential to create a system of incentives to get buy-in from these neutral countries. Um, but we believe that the best way to do this, and I will hand it to Hugo in a moment to explain how we would do this, is through collective action based on a message that everyone has an interest in building resilience, collective resilience, against the potential for PRC economic coercion. All right, so here's a cartoon of the Marshall Plan. Imagine you, the United States, 
creates a thing. Call it an economic security cooperation board. And you give it two mandates that you then intertwine. The first mandate is it is going to be the US vehicle for economic crisis response. Because regardless of any of this, any Taiwan crisis is going to be a massive economic and financial shock. The US is going to want to act as it did in 2008, as it did during COVID. You give it a second mandate of oversight and support for trade enforcement. And through intertwining those two mandates and providing a rules-based way independent of the United States, operationally independent of the United States, for assessing cases of systemic transshipment, you do two things. One is you reassure allies and third countries that they can continue to trade with China in any scenario and that the US is not using this as a backdoor to, to systemic protectionism. But secondly, you take the greatest challenge of any economic contingency plan for Taiwan, which is transshipment, and you throw at it the greatest incentives the US and core allies have, which is sustained and continued access to markets. At the end of the day, that core that Ike mentioned represents 40% of global demand and China represents 15. Over time, the incentives align for continuing to have access to that market. And the Economic Security Cooperation Board, or something like that, is a way of saying, if you are systemically transshipping, in a rules we will find in a rules-based way that you are allowed to be seen by other countries as a systemic security threat too, either by sector or in total. And in that way, you are creating not only a short-term incentive of economic support from the United States, but a long-term incentive in terms of market access to hit that, on that minimum bar that allows the United States contingency plan to focus on its own market and the market of its core allies, rather than seeking to interdict global trade. So we're going to throw this open to questions in a moment, because I'm aware we have a very, very prestigious audience who will may, or may have a lot to say. But I want to conclude on this point. There is a fascinating theoretical debate that we've been getting into since we brought out this report in July about whether the most effective deterrent over Taiwan is to increase economic uncertainty or to strive for economic certainty and confidence. And the, those who are advocating a sanctions-led approach are emphasizing the uncertainty side, right? We threaten lots of really scary things, which we may do or we may not do, but they'll create so much fear and panic. The challenge with that is that we are trying to build a broad-based coalition to draw a line if the PRC crosses certain of our own red lines with respect to Taiwan that are incredibly complex for reasons everyone in this room is familiar. And so if our focus is only on increasing uncertainty, given the complexities of drawing that line, we run a real risk of deterring ourselves. And what we would argue is that instead we should be focusing on contingency planning that respects the broad suite of US and allied interests and recognizes the incentives facing an overwhelming number of third countries. And that it is only by focusing contingency planning in that area that we can build a coherent deterrent that will maintain peace and stability. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take the prerogative as the moderator task to opening questions, and then we'll open up to the audience. So uh, for those of you in the audience, please uh, get your questions ready. Um, the first question that I want to ask is, uh, deterrence theory also suggests that in order for it to be effective, there needs to be assurance. Um, however, uh, in order to execute this plan on day one, there are things that if you anticipate that there's a possibility of a day zero, there are things you would want to do in day negative 200 or even day negative 150 or whatever day you believe we're in today. Um, and those may not seem so reassuring to the PRC. So the first question that I have is, to what extent would you advocate for certainty from the assurance element of deterrence that um, what we would or would not do in preparation for a possible day zero, um, all of which would be types of moves which would have some negative consequence 
to the PRC, but as Nicholas Mulder's work has suggested, the clearer you communicate what that is, the less it sort of backs someone into misinterpreting what is your deterrent strategy. Um, so I'll start with that first question, and I'll toss a second question out here uh, to you all as well. Um, second question is a little bit less theoretical, but one, since th we're in the critical issues confronting China series, um, I wanted to ask this question from China's standpoint. Um, certainly what you present in this report is something that Chinese policymakers have considered as well. And before we get to the day zero scenario, um, there is a spillover effect of firms today um, thinking that there is a higher cost of investment in China, which is having a negative impact on China's ability to uh, spark its economy as it continues to deal with the headwinds from its property crisis and other economic crises as well. So uh, from that standpoint, um, are there certain things that China can do to signal today on the economic front um, or are all of the signals that it could send would be with respect to the actions in the Taiwan Straits or in the South China Sea or elsewhere, i.e. in the non-economic front, which would actually have the greatest impact on maintaining or perhaps facilitating uh, renewed economic growth or stronger economic growth in China in the near term uh, prior to day zero. So I'll throw out both of those questions, I hope. Um, Okay, I'll do briefly reassurance and then hand over to Ike on, on the China side. Um, we maintain in this report and in our work a distinction between de-risking and decoupling. The reason we maintain that distinction is manyfold, but one of them is the enormous complexity and cost of the kind of ideas we are proposing. And we make absolutely clear in this report that, we, that when we think about the broad suite of US-China trade, the enormous task of attempting that kind of decoupling is only possible in scenarios of real crisis in the Taiwan Strait and after there is a bipartisan consensus in Congress that America is willing to bear an enormous economic pain to achieve that decoupling. I think making that clear and sketching out the scale and complexity of the task has a reassuring effect. Because I think maintaining that distinction between de-risking de and decoupling is essentially saying that China can continue to fulfill a role in the global trading system, absent a, move, a, a violation of US red lines over Taiwan. And I think demonstrating the scale of the challenge of decoupling is a way to continue to emphasize the distinction between de-risking and de decoupling. It's not a perfect reassurance. And one thing we are not arguing is that, this, that deterrence exists only in the economic sphere, right? This is a broad suite of ideas, um, and I'll let Ike speak to that. But I think talking about the scale and complexity of the challenge, talking about the scale of the, al the coordination with close allies we would need, has itself within it a demonstration that this is not something we are seeking to do to advance our interests, and would only do if not just punishing China, but breaking our, prior, our dependence on China's production and our allies' dependence on China's production over the long term became such a burning national priority that we were prepared to take risks that no one right now, despite the bipartisan consensus on China, is prepared to contemplate. So I think Hugo has articulated the answer to uh, question one perfectly. The only thing I would say in response to the framing of question one is why do we care about reassurance at all? And the reason, as we know from Tom Schelling's classic work, is that the threat, one more step and I'll shoot, will deter them from taking a step only if there is a credible promise, and if you don't step, I won't shoot. There has to be a dual part message to Xi Jinping, that not only we can, that we can create unacceptable costs and risks for him, if he chooses to cross U.S. red lines, but also that there is a world that he can live with if he chooses not to cross U.S. red lines. And it is very important that we extend that thinking into the economic sphere just as we do in the nuclear sphere and the conventional military sphere. So I think this is a very relevant and important question to ask. Reassurance is not weakness. It is a sign of thoughtful and effective deterrence.
To answer the second question, which I think is very um, important and also related to the first, I think you have to understand that Xi Jinping is pursuing his own strategy of de-risking. It's called dual circulation. And if you read any remarks that he has given on economic security since around 2018, it's very clear that he is sending the message across the party state that he wants to break China's dependence on external production, especially in key science and technology areas. Now, work that I have done, which is publishing, which is coming out uh, soon, separately from this project, looks as systematically as we can, based on the open source uh, literature that we have from China, on how this has been interpreted. And the view seems to be there is a uh, there is a significant risk that uh, trade war, uh, Mao Yijiangjiang, could escalate or evolve into financial war. So the threat is already there, that the United States might employ sanctions in some kind of crisis, or even might try to tempt China into a crisis in which it would employ sanctions. Xi Jinping has been working as hard as he possibly can to build China's resilience to the sorts of sanctions that the United States imposed on Russia. And I'm sure that the example of 2022 has established the precedent that sanctions will always be on the table. But one of the things we learn from reading the PRC literature, which informs our finding in this report, is that China is increasing its confidence that it has resilience to that initial shock. And Russia's experience overcoming that initial shock uh, should be a reason for some positivity and optimism. China can, to a certain extent, make itself sanctions proof insofar as it can tighten capital controls, the ability of capital to flow out of the country, insofar as it can get its currency used overseas and get some of its key trading partners on uh, China-controlled trade settlement mechanisms. And as China gains increasing certainty that it is building resilience to that financial gut punch, the threat of sanctions won't go away, but it will begin to lose its deterrent effect. The thing that China can't work around is the threat to take China's external market away. And if I can just move to the next slide, you know, this is a bit too punchy to end on, but it's important uh, to throw in the supplementary slides. This is Brad Setzer's data. This is uh, his calculation of China's true current account surplus, the amount that China is exporting, less the amount that it's importing. And as you can see, this number has skyrocketed since COVID. Because for the reasons that Mark mentioned, the stagnant consumer, the, the horrifically problematic real estate situation, uh, China has run out of things to invest in, and the China consumer, Chinese China, consumer isn't buying stuff. So the only way to deliver continued growth is to subsidize manufacturing to sell to the rest of the world. This inevitably creates a conflict of interest between China and other countries that want to manufacture stuff. And we're seeing this in the case of Europe, in Indonesia, Brazil, all countries that have imposed trade restrictions of some kind or another on products from China. The thing that China cannot fix, because it is a chronic condition of China's political economy, is that if China runs a big current account surplus and they export more than they import, someone else on the other side has to import more than they export. And so for countries, including many countries in the global south who were talking about being part of the coalition, this means as long as China is part of this integrated global economy, there's not a clear pathway to industrial development. So in a sense, while what we are talking about is not the, the, the big scary stick of the financial gut punch on day one, in a sense, what it is threatening Xi Jinping with is something that is much harder to defend against because it's threatening something that is just endemic to the model of political economy that he wants for his country. Great, thank you. Um, we'll open up to questions and um, in the spirit of uh, the new academic year, uh, I want to first ask if there are any questions from students in the audience. If you could please identify and introduce yourself and uh, please make sure uh, to state your question succinctly and make sure it ends with a question mark. Of course. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Kendall. I'm a third year at the college studying history. I'm curious to hear you all paint the picture of what day 3,000, 6,000, 9,000 looks like. Um, 
because the the forty percent to fifteen percent comparison on global demand makes a lot of sense. I'm convinced you get some swath of the world to switch over industrial manufacturing to the United States or allied countries, but I don't know where this leaves us like twenty years down the line. Um, is the idea to starve China into some sort of reform to make a world that runs outside of China that China turns domestic exclusively, et cetera? Okay. First of all, great question. Um, and ended with a question as well. When we're thinking about the long-term prospects of this, we have to think about what kind of world will sustain U.S. interests over the long term. Even in the optimum scenario that you could outline on the basis of this report, China is still exporting. No measures have been taken to prevent China exporting to third countries that want to buy Chinese products. Many third countries will still wish to do so. What will have changed in that sort of simultaneously best in that this is all happening perfectly and worst in that there has been no change in Chinese behavior as a result scenario is that China is increasingly isolated from the rulemaking tables of the international economy in that economic security as an essential plank of how trade works going forward facilitates states if they want to protecting their own markets from Chinese products and facilitating the US and core allies doing the same. I think you can make a kind of theoretical argument, and I'm, I'm, Ike and I are in the early stages of thinking this through, that in a world of systemic competition, a world in which China and the US do not trade or barely trade directly, but continue to trade with third markets and neutral states and third countries are empowered relative to those two, is a more stable world. It is certainly a world that imposes sustained threats to the Chinese model of political economy. Um, there is a magic land in which China does domestic reforms and increases consumption to solve the problem, but I think I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not exactly holding out for that one. But it is certainly a world with a sustained challenge to China's political economy, and one in which China would be, would be incentivized to make concessions, whatever they would be. I don't think it is worth getting into the precise nature of that. But I do think there is something to be said for showing not only the United States and its domestic consumers, but also close US allies, a pathway on day 3000 to not being dependent on the Chinese market, particularly if China has acted against Taiwan in a meaningful way, and to insulating themselves from future economic coercion from China. And that a world that respects and understands the interests of third states is a much more stable world and framework for geopolitical competition. But as I say, I, I'm sort of tentatively moving into that space. Just one more thing I'd add to your question, Kendall, uh, to what, what Hugo said. This is a world in which there has been some sort of U.S.-China crisis in which the United States and its core allies have, cho to, have chosen to bear a significant cost in order to decouple bilaterally from China. Let's make no mistake. The reason China makes so much stuff is that industrial policy or not, China is able to produce a lot of stuff at a quality for the price that no one else can beat. So if we're talking about a world where we move production from China to someplace else, we are talking about a world where consumers pay a price because they're, they're accepting inferior goods for higher prices. And that's a decision that political leaders would need to take in any day one scenario when they're considering policies that might have a, an effect rupturing the trade relationship. But I think there's something very important about the world on day 3000 that doesn't apply in a sanction scenario. And that is, this is a world in which there still exists a rules-based trading system, which is evolved out of, you can say, the ruins of the current WTO structure. And it looks a little bit different, but the basic premise is there are rules of the road. Everyone within the tent follows the rules of the road. Insofar as those within the tent trade with those out of the tent, they need to follow the rules of the road because there are conduits in. But if the, the, the countries on the outside try to weaponize uh, economic dependencies against countries in the tent, there's collective resilience. Yeah. That is a vision which relatively speaking, is, I think, very attractive, not only to the United States but, and its core partners, but also to a broad suite of the global economy. And it's also 
talking about sustaining a system that can potentially choose in the future if China's behavior change, changes to re-engage with China in some way. A choice was made in the late 1990s and early aughts that we were going to invite China and Russia into the WTO, a vehicle that has no expulsion mechanism. Now that bet, that was a bet that interaction through trade would socialize these countries. Now that bet failed with respect to Russia. It hasn't yet failed with respect to China, and it's important to recognize that. But I, I suppose you can, you can put what we're saying this way. If that bet does fail with respect to China, we don't want to make that mistake again, but we also don't want it to be at the cost of the system that we've built. I think the only thing that, that yes, one addendum, we use the term systemic national security threat. There is a very specific origin of that term, which is, it is designed to build this into the complying with the letter of the GATT charter from the WTO, which does allow, in Article 21, you to take steps to protect your national security. Now, no one has ever labeled trade with an entire state or portions of an entire state a national security threat. But it is technically compliant, and it is a very important signal to say we are not blowing up rules, we are not undermining the system, the system will evolve with time, but that is an essential part of what we're proposing, that respect and tolerance. So I'll open up to general questions. Anyone has a question? Um, Paul Tucker, Kennedy School. Excuse my voice. <clears throat> I like this very much for what it's worth, as Hugo knows. I particularly like the um, focus on France, Britain in the 18th century, which is at the center of my own book. Um, but I have a question, which is, I don't know whether you can easily get the slide with your four principles. Um, while you're doing that, yeah, okay. So you started off with a kind of extraordinary quotation from the House, there is no contingency planning. The, these, my question is, is whether these are principles, however admirable, they may be optimal for a particular state of the world. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the things about crisis management is to recognize what kind of crisis one's in. So this, this, these principles are presupposing a containable crisis as opposed to, God help us, total war with, with China. So don't you need, my question is whether you need at least criteria, which are empirical criteria, for deciding whether or not you want your agents to stick with these principles and in what circumstances they should be shifting away from these principles and to a different strategy, um, including, in those circumstances, um, shifting objectives, as well as shifting um, one's understanding of one's instruments, etc. I think when we imagine what the outbreak of a U.S.-China crisis would do to global markets and international trade, it's important to start from the assumption that supply chains will get really messed up even if the U.S. takes no steps uh, in the economic realm, simply because if there's bullets or missiles flying uh, in the Taiwan Strait, ships will find it impossible, commercial ships will find it impossible to get insured. And especially at the outset of a crisis where the, the military outcome is unknown, no one will know how long that might be the case. So supply chains will be broken anyway, especially if there's a kinetic crisis, but also in some blockade quarantine scenarios. And that would have, a, that would have an effect of imposing great economic pain on both sides. But I think, to go back to the example Hugo cited of the Atlantic Charter, it's very important during a conflict that one be able to articulate a common vision of what one is fighting for, especially if, if, if it's your team that faces the harder coalition management problem, as we undoubtedly would. So is it possible 
for the United States, given its domestic politics, to abide perfectly by these four principles? I don't think any of us can know the answer to that. But I think insofar as we are able to credibly commit to these principles in the event and state them consistently in language that is consistent and negotiated together with our core allies, I think they will send a clear message to markets and to neutrals. But I'm curious to hear what Hugo says. Um, we're, we're two Brits in America, so I'll cite a third one, the great Laurie Friedman, who begins his book on strategy with the quote of a boxer, Mike Tyson, that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, I think it is very hard in moments of crisis to stick to the precise wheels of a plan. However, we put a focus in this on not only global coalition building and allied coalition building, but bipartisan consensus dom domestically in the United States. And we have really taken care when writing this report to respect different interests in that world and to write it in a way that is politically neutral. That's point one, point two, and then I'll sort of swing around. Point two is even in the most extreme conflict scenarios, trade finds a way. Um, there's a, the most hilarious example of this is what I think of as the canning problem, which is British soldiers in 1914 taking an enemy trench and finding that the food in the German trench was the same as their own. It was being imported to Germany via neutral Denmark. Even in the most extreme scenarios, there is an economy that functions. It is a distorted economy. It is a wild economy. But it is an economy that functions. And you need a set of principles for that economy. I don't think it would be wise to start peering too closely into the crystal ball and coming up with scenarios in which you would wish to tweak this and scenarios in which you would wish to tweak that. Because if you go down that road of increasing that complexity, the capacity to stick to the plan once you are punched in the mouth gets harder with every step of complexity you take. In private, the punching in the mouth still happens. You would know this better than I do. I think it is a fascinating conversation about what reassurances and things you do as the think tankers in DC say, left of boom, before crisis. Post-crisis, there's going to be an awful lot of thinking on, on one's feet. But I think common principles based on respect for not only US national interests, but the national interests of third countries are relevant, not guiding, not shaping, but relevant, no matter where you take it. Hi, I'm Akib. I'm an undergraduate studying government and also concurrently doing regional studies East Asia. Um, my question is just also on the slide about giving firms adequate time to reshore. I think there's really hard to define what adequate time means yeah. versus so much time that it's no longer an effective policy. Um, so I'm just wondering how that actually, how you all think through that. Um, I also wonder in a sense in terms of if it's a so, so effective of a policy that much manufacturing is reshored, what incentive does China actually have to come to the negotiating table if they can't have back what they had um, in terms of having a healthy Chinese economy again? So let me take a first crack at this. It's an impossible question to answer for multiple reasons, how fast the ratchet should move. The main one is we're not in the event and we're not in the room. In the event, if God forbid it ever comes, someone will be in the White House, some party will control the Senate, some party will control the House, and some set of individuals will be in charge of the relevant committees. Now, our system creates a bunch of veto points for decisions like this to be made. And the way these things work in our system is through horse trading. Then there's the question of coalition management. Even if the United States is prepared to go fast, maybe Japan is not, or is prepared, wants to go slower, or wants some industries to move faster than others. These are things we would learn only in the event, and they would have to do with the context of the crisis as well, and how much de-risking had been done beforehand. Uh, so that's why we can justify ourselves in the cop-out of not giving an answer. But I would say this. There's no, what we have proposed here is a mechanism. 
It is a flexible mechanism. There's no reason in principle why some industry's supply chain shouldn't move faster than others. I would wager that the supply chain for making this mug can move out of China a lot faster than the supply chain for making my iPhone. So there is inevitably going to be horse trading and distinctions that are made industry by industry, if not product by product. But the idea is through neg negotiation discussion to find a reasonable amount of time that is not going to cause severe shortages, but which puts the squeeze on companies once they understand the speed of the ratchet to get out and find the best country to move to. Nothing to add to that. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Koichi Nakano. I'm an affiliate with the US Japan program uh, from uh, Sofia University in Tokyo. And um, uh, I would, I'd like to come back to this question of credibility uh, in terms of, because um, I think you know, for any country and for the US too, uh, p perhaps particularly at this juncture, to expect the kind of, you know, the, uh, to, um, to believe in the ability of the United States to pursue a rational policy seems to be quite <laughs> a stretching the imagination. And there's also, with the ongoing wars also, but um, in general with the election coming up and, and so forth. But and whoever wins, I guess, you know, we live in a time when white supremacism is probably more pronounced in our eyes than more recent times, perhaps, in politics. And um, I say this because I come from Japan and uh, I have in mind particularly the writings of John Dower in terms of the American sort of, uh, you know, strategy in East Asia in the post-war period. And uh, so two examples, I guess. One is that um, Japan was, according to Dower, guided by the United States in the aftermath of the defeat to abandon China, to give up on China, which has turned red, and to focus on Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, as a sort of economic zone uh, under American blessing. And of course, that was kind of possible, but the conditions were so vastly different. Japan's economy was dead. America was so much more powerful and richer. And China, of course, was still very much, you know, um, not even developing, I guess, at the time. And um, essentially, America sponsored Japan's post war political uh, economic success. But America clearly is not in a position to do so. And uh, the actors involved are so many more uh, in numbers and, uh, uh, and also more developed compared to uh, the past. So that's one example. And eventually, of course, there was the Nixon return, right? And the other one is really that... Uh, Jose, can I just interrupt? I think the, our, uh, our guests get the... Uh, I just want to make sure we have time for one more. Yeah, question. sure, sure. Yeah, sorry, yeah, but sorry, uh, sorry. just one thing is uh, that... Because, uh, you know, the language that we hear about today about China is so reminiscent of the language in the United States about, China, uh, about Japan back in the 1980s and 1990s, how there's going to be a war with Japan. Uh, because Japan, you know, America's hegemony is being threatened on the economic front. So that's another credibility issue. I'm going to, as, as a fellow US ally in the room, I'm going to answer this very quickly with two points. Firstly, I have more faith in the US system than that. Um, I particularly have faith, to an extent, in the capacity of Congress um, to take big steps in moments of crisis that would have been inconceivable before that crisis. One would think of COVID as an example of that, but there are many, many others. And an essential point of this report is it is, it is, a, it is an economic contingency plan based on cooperation between, yes, a White House, but above all, congressional leadership. This is not a plan purely in that space. Um, the comparison with post-war is fascinating. I have seen the Japan in the 80s, 90s comparison bandied about, um, and that book aged terribly. Um, this is not that. There are things that we are doing in a high-tech space to respond to a manufacturing challenge. There are things the Biden administration is doing right now. They are perfectly legitimate and will continue. Everyone is doing it. The European Union is doing it. I would point out that many of the things the US doing, is doing in the trade space are not exclusively targeted at China, though that is where a lot of the rhetoric goes. That is a different conversation to a conversation about deterrence and contingency planning in the Taiwan Strait. That's a different world to the, the, the world of overcapacity and response. I think you raise a good point that 
it is very difficult to imagine the United States doing this in peacetime. Um, and all that I would say is a crisis scenario is different. We have to assume that it would be. And if it's not, are sanctions viable either? Is a Malacca blockade viable either? What alternative economic contingency plan does the United States have that would advance its interests? So it's a, it's a legitimate point of view to have to question the political feasibility. But I think if that is your view, I would ask in response, what is the alternative? I'll take one last question down here in the first row here. Hi. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Jie Dalei, a uh, uh, visiting scholar at MIT and originally from Peking University in China. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, uh, just a very brief uh, comment and question. Uh, the comment is that when you uh, talk about the, reject the rejection of the binary choices, I think it actually reminds me of the debate in the Cold War about the U.S. nuclear strategy, uh, uh, the critiques of the massive retaliation, right, because it's not credible. It's either uh, capitulation or uh, suicide. So I think you're presenting a, a more a nuanced uh, um, plan. Uh, my question is that, um, uh, so are, are you two devising this contingency plan as a deterrent in advance, or are you actually suggesting that if it fails or something happens across the Taiwan Street, uh, you actually uh, propose to carry this out? Because if it's the latter, uh, you know, deterrent theory says if something already happens, deterrence has already failed. So what's good for carrying it out? I guess, the, you know, which two? I would, yeah. I would draw your attention to the point about the vital interest in the event of a Taiwan crisis, in which the PRC has proven itself not to be abiding by U.S. red lines, of breaking the U.S. and allied dependence on the Chinese market on over the long term. So my answer is both. We have a line in the report that... A viable contingency plan is the best deterrent. You can threaten things that you wouldn't want to do, and who knows, maybe you would do them. But the best thing the United States can do, we think, at this point in time, is articulate something that would fulfill, at least to some bare minimum level, all of the national interests that would be relevant in the crisis. And I think that should be developed as much as possible and left as one of the options on the table. Uh, but I think if, if the moment came, we would face a difficult choice and none of the alternatives would be cost free. Uh, but I think it's very important that at least one of the options that's been developed in the advance be based on a positive, affirmative vision, not just on threats of economic mutually assured destruction, which may or may not work. So on that note, uh, I want to thank all of you for being here uh, with us. Uh, for those who are students or for those who came late, I want to especially draw your attention to, if you haven't already, please do sign up for our student network. There's a, a QR code there. There are brochures here. Um, and uh, I want to draw your attention again to next week. Uh, we will have Oriana Scholar Mastro here, who will be speaking on the future of great power competition. Uh, so Hugo, Ike, thank you very much for forcing us to think about what we would do on day one, but I think also forcing uh, policymakers, not only in Beijing and Washington, to think about what they can do to avoid getting to day zero and what's necessary in the interim so thank that so we never hit that tripwire. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our guest speakers. I would, be, I would be criminal not to point out, we do have a few copies of this if anyone wants one. Thank you, Mark.